I'm John Lorden, and I've been looking into mysterious occurrences on YouTube since 2015. Joining me today are some friends from Uncovered.com. I'm Rachel Roslett, a forensic psychologist and head of case research and data at Uncovered. I'm Andrea Cipriano. I'm also a forensic psychologist, and I'm a case researcher and content creator at Uncovered. Welcome back to Lorden Arts Uncovered. And today, we're looking into the unsolved case of Patrick Lee Mullins. Known as the Friendly City, Bradenton, Florida is located along Florida's Gulf Coast. The city's website boasts that Bradenton is a wonderful place to raise a family, to work, and to play, with public art, beautiful parks, fine dining, and entertainment options aplenty. For someone that likes working on motors, fishing, and boating, like Patrick Lee Mullins did, the access to the beautiful Manatee River and Anna Maria Island just could not be beat. The largest tributary of the Manatee River is the Braden River, a 21-mile waterway, and it's on that waterway that a tragic and difficult-to-understand occurrence took place. Rachel, Andrea, please tell us a little more about Patrick and how this timeline comes together. For Patrick Lee Mullins, life seems sweet indeed in Manatee County, Florida in 2013. The happily married 52-year-old was looking forward to celebrating his 30th wedding anniversary that June with his beloved wife, Jill, an educator. Pat was the proud father of two grown sons, Mason, who served in the Army and was deployed to Afghanistan, and Miles, a civil engineering major at the University of South Florida. The Mullins men enjoyed each other's company and spent many happy hours rehabbing an old army jeep and off-roading through some of the rougher terrain in the county. A member of the Deferred Retirement Option Program called DROP, Pat was also anticipating retiring soon from a satisfying career as a popular and well-regarded school librarian and media specialist at Palmetto High School in Palmetto, Florida. Pat was described as a primarily sensible guy who had a dry sense of humor with a nice satirical streak and he was popular with adults and students alike. Friends portrayed him as kind, sensitive, an all-around great guy, a family man, and a real friend. At school, Mr. Mullins could always be counted on to encourage students to explore the joys of recreational reading, and he would frequently quietly pay the ACT and SAT fees for students who were struggling financially. He believed in his students and their ability to succeed. So while he earned a comfortable salary, even while employed at the school, he could expect a windfall of upwards of $150,000 upon retiring. Once he left the academic world, Pat had no intention of merely playing golf. A skilled mechanic, Pat's greatest hobby was collecting and restoring old Evan Rude boat motors. Growing up on Florida's Anna Maria Island, Pat was an avid fisherman and boater. He hoped to spend some of his retirement earnings on purchasing and running a boat motor repair shop with his brother, Bert, who also worked at the high school. Pat owned a 16 foot stump knocker skiff that he liked to take out, frequently testing the engines he had recently tinkered with. On January 27th, 2013, Pat took his boat out on the Braden River somewhere between 3 and 4 p.m., allegedly to test an engine he'd recently rehabbed. Pat would have launched the boat about 300 yards west of his home, which was located on a tributary of the river. I just got to say right off the bat, I, I like this guy. Like uh, yeah. Knowing that he's giving so much to his community, that he's supporting students by paying for their testing like that, and working hard, getting to an early retirement, and with plans for the future, he's ready to roll into another business doing something that he loves now that he's kind of, you know, got got a career knocked out and has mm -hmm. um, proceeds that are coming in from that. So 
seemingly doing what he loves, working on his boat, yep. deciding that he's going to go out on this day. Did he tell anyone where he was headed or when they should expect him back? Some sources indicated that he left a note for Jill, letting her know that he was taking the boat out for a spin, but other sources say that he just spoke with her. Okay. The investigation also learned um, that before launching the boat, he was actually seen at a store on State Route 64 buying some items. He purchased a drain valve for an air conditioner and a set of welding goggles that were on sale. So sounds just like normal stuff and kind of sounds like just an average day so far. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, but unfortunately, the normal day would change as Jill returned home from family obligations that she had in Sarasota, and she comes back to an empty house. As the hours ticked by with no sign of Pat, she became concerned and called her son, Miles. Miles raced home from the University of South Florida, and family and friends began searching the neighboring streets and waterways, looking in vain for Pat and his boat. Jill called 911 to report her husband missing, and the following day, the investigation really began in earnest with detectives from the Manatee County, Manatee County Sheriff's Office and other law enforcement agencies. Multiple authorities were brought in, including the Coast Guard, the Manatee County Marine Patrol, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Also the following day, a member of the Tampa Bay Pilots Association spotted Pat's boat near Egmont Key. The tugboat captain had called the St. Petersburg station at 10 a.m. to report that there was a boat adrift, and it was determined that the craft belonged to Pat. The engine was running, and the gas can and some personal items of Pat's were intact inside the boat. It was located a considerable distance from where Pat would have launched on the river, at least a two to three hour trip from his house. And now that sounds like a lot more than some little test run on an engine. Uh, of course, considering that his motor was running, who knows how far the boat could have traveled with no one actually in it. Authorities hmm. and family felt it was much more likely that something happened closer to home in the Braden or Manatee Rivers. After the discovery of the stump knocker, the Coast Guard and other agencies inspected the area for nearly 70 hours. They covered more than 2,200 square miles in their search, um, looking to find any sign of pets. The effort included six vessels from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, or FWC, a patrol vessel, a C-130 airplane, and a helicopter from the U.S. Coast Guard, and a search and rescue team from Eckerd College. They called off the search the night of January 29th, having no success in finding Pat. Now, this just has to be absolutely terrorizing this poor family. I mean, we've got a guy entering retirement age. My mind is going to, was there possibly some type of medical event while he was out on the water? Like, you know, did he have a heart attack or something? Mm hmm. Yeah, all normal thoughts to have. And for the family, unfortunately, this was an agonizing wait that lasted seven days. And unfortunately, there would be no question of whether or not this was a health related event. On February 5th, while fishing off of Emerson Point near the mouth of the Manatee River, a charter boat fisherman spotted what he initially thought was a mannequin under four feet of water near a seagrass bed. A closer look revealed the awful truth that he had discovered a human body. A 25-pound anchor was tied to the remains, and there was what looked to be a shotgun blast to the head, a wound that would eventually be determined to be the cause of death. Leaving the body undisturbed, the fishermen contacted FWC and subsequently the District 12 Medical Examiner's Office. When Dr. Wilson Broussard arrived at the scene, he noted multiple exit wounds from buckshot on the top of the victim's head during his initial examination, even though the back of the skull, cheeks, and face were no longer intact. This is unbelievable. And the way that you're describing that wound, of course, the first thing I'm thinking is, are we looking at a possible self-harm situation? But there's a bigger question. Do we even know that this is Patrick? Yeah. So an identification card retrieved from the body indicated that it was Patrick Lee Mullins. An autopsy conducted the following morning would also confirm these initial findings and positively identify his remains. 
And while the cause of death was indeed confirmed to be the shotgun blast to the head, the manner of death was officially listed as inconclusive. Interestingly, Pat had no known financial, health, or substance abuse issues, nor did he have any serious problems in his personal life. It was nearly unthinkable to Jill, his sons, his family, and his friends that he'd have a reason to do himself harm. Yet this is how some of the authorities were treating his death. On February 7th, 2013, 600 people gathered to celebrate the life of this beloved school librarian and media specialist. Friends, family, and even students honored Pat's memory with stories, anecdotes, songs, and tears. 600 people. I mean, obviously, this is someone very important to his community, and I'm already hearing some really big problems in this story. Uh, we have him stopping and buying things that are obviously for later use. You know, the welding goggles, the the other valve. We have an anchor tied to him. And I know there's some question of did he tie it to himself or did someone tie him up using it? Um, but I, th I guess he could have possibly tied it to himself first, then got out of the boat. I, But there's a really big problem I'm having, and that's where's the gun? If this is mm -hmm. a self-harm situation, why are we not hearing about the weapon being found? Uh, and with that, I just don't know how law enforcement's looking at this like he ended his own life. Right. And he, he didn't even leave behind a note. I, most fascinating is he didn't even own a shotgun. <laughs> um, yeah, big problems. Big problems mm -hmm. with this. Um, you know, even if he got out of the boat, he stood in the four foot deep water, straps the anchor to himself. I mean, that gun should literally be found right next to him. Uh, the only thing I can mm -hmm. wonder about is, I mean, it's only a 25 pound anchor. If it's not engaged with the ground directly, is there some possibility that he could have floated away from the location where the actual shooting took place? I, I don't know. Uh, do we know if the shooting actually happened in the boat? There was no blood, no brain matter, bits of skull, or bodily fluids found in the stump knocker. So law enforcement's theory seems to defy logic in the sense where they theorize that Pat may have wrapped himself in the rope attached to the anchor, perched himself on the edge of the craft, and then shot himself with a shotgun angled upwards. Yeah, I don't know. In my mind, I'm still thinking that that shotgun winds up in one of two places. It's either going to be by his body or possibly in the situation they're trying to describe. Maybe it could have landed back in the boat. They would have found it in the boat, but... Yeah, and, and they also don't explain how he would have even been able to reach the trigger. They couldn't account for the fact that no, there was not a speck of forensic evidence found in the boat. Further challenging law enforcement's conclusion was the discovery during his autopsy that while it was clear that Pat was shot at close range, there was no stippling near the entrance wound which stippling would be indicative of a contact wound. So that was not present. So he's using a shotgun far enough away from his face that there's no stippling. Um, yeah. Doesn't seem possible. It doesn't. I mean, unless mm -mm. you're rigging it up somewhere and like using, I mean, this sounds like something I've heard about in some fictional crime story or something like, oh, he actually used a tree or well, there was one where there were like someone right. used a balloon or something to actually, you know, pull the trigger and carry the gun away or something like this just doesn't sound like it's based in reality. But I think, a, I think we've all watched enough documentaries to know that if there's a shotgun involved, that's one of the first things people are always trying to figure out how they would have shot yeah. themselves with a shotgun. Mm. Um, and it doesn't make sense here. Hmm. It definitely doesn't. And it took almost half a year for the family to learn further medical details about Pat's death. So the chief medical examiner, Dr. Russell Vega, eventually told them that the shotgun was fired below Pat's right earlobe at the rear of his cheek with a slight upward trajectory. The doctor admitted that he had never seen a self-inflicted gunshot wound of this nature. So again... We don't have a gun. We have the Emmy raising huge questions about not only the distance of the barrel to the victim, but now also the trajectory. 
How can the sheriff's department be ignoring this analysis? Well, he also supported the theory of Patrick taking his own life, primarily because Pat's lifestyle, he says, did not seem consistent with being a murder victim, which is odd. Additionally, he speculated that the manner in which the anchor rope was tied seemed to have been self-engineered, meaning Patrick could have tied that knot himself. This... This analysis is starting to get a little weird to me. First of all, have, have you ladies ever heard of anything like this? You've been through, oh, you, both of you, highly educated in this field and working in it currently, reviewing hundreds of cases. Have you ever heard of some type of makeup of a particular murder victim or people that would be omitted from being a murder victim? Absolutely not. <laughs> I think, you know, and in, in the world of, of victimology, particularly, of course, there's this concept of if a victim is living a high risk lifestyle, you increase the chance of, of being a victim of a crime. But that doesn't mean that there is like a sphere of this is a crime victim and this is not. It's not one mm -hmm. or the other. Anybody could be a crime victim. So the idea that what this medical examiner is saying is they're only supporting suicide because his lifestyle is not consistent with being a murder victim makes no sense. Mm -mm. And just because he could have tied the rope himself, it doesn't preclude someone else tying it too. Ooh, right. I'm losing things. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So that, you know, just because he could have tied it himself doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's right. another well, possibility, he right, Andrea? Mm hmm. Right. If he so even if it does show that he tied it himself based on the way that the knot is facing or something like that, who's to say that they didn't tie the knot or Pat didn't tie the knot himself at gunpoint from somebody else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something. And especially when we're talking about the trajectory um, being under his right earlobe. And we don't know if he's right or left handed, but, I, you know, we know most people are right handed. Um it, it sounds to me like, is he standing possibly on his boat? Someone else is in another boat alongside of him. They're in a seated position. They're aiming up at him. Like that seems like a pretty reasonable possibility. And it's just strange to me that you have the ME that's pointing out these, these problems in terms of what he's seeing forensically, but then kind of taking this detective analysis and even a psychology or criminology aspect and trying to weave it mm -hmm. in there in a way that just doesn't seem very accurate or scientific. Like, I'm just confused because yeah. usually, you know, I, I read my fair share of autopsy reports. And sometimes I'm very surprised at this where I'll see information that's really a detective's level of information that winds up in the narrative around the autopsy report. And it will sometimes kind of color the Emmy's perspective in, in terms of what they're seeing with it. Um, there's other times where I read autopsy reports and they are just highly scientific and they just do not allow any of that other influence. They're like, this is what we're finding. This is, you know, the weight of these organs. This is the coloring that we're seeing. This is like, they're very, very detailed and scientific and they don't mm -hmm. go to this kind of detective analysis that we're kind of, we're hearing about with this one. As part of, you know, advanced education, you're frequently taught how to testify in court or how to present your findings in um, a way that you're not speculating on those things. And, you know, I was always taught and coached that you should testify like the latter situation you described where it's highly scientific here are the things that I observed. You don't make the conclusions. That's not your job. You just present the evidence that you've seen. Um, and so it feels wrong to me that he was making some of these conclusions. It seems outside of his purview. Yeah. I mean, I understand that we're talking about a case that has very, very tough conditions. Like this, this is not mm -hmm. an easy case to understand. I, I totally get that. On top of that, we have to think that there's a family that's coming along for this ride as well. And I just cannot think with conjecture like this and, you know, these kind of non answered answers for these questions, how are they feeling going through all this? 
Pat's family suggested that Pat may have encountered an armed and dangerous individual on the river and inadvertently witnessed something that he should not have seen. So something likely connected to drug smuggling. And because Pat was the type of person to stop and lend a hand to anybody in distress, it would have been easy for someone to fake engine engine trouble to lure Pat into a deadly situation before Pat was even aware that there was actually danger. Hmm. It would be interesting to know if what the, the statistics for that type of crime is in this area. Um, and that brings us to a possible person of interest. Due to some truly bizarre behavior on his part, there were indications that a family friend named Damon Crestwood may have been involved or know something about Pat's death. Known as a likable, friendly person, Damon Crestwood was close to Pat's brother, but not particularly close to Pat himself. Crestwood undergoes a personality change after Pat's disappearance. He's frequently spotted looking out on the Manatee River, sobbing uncontrollably, sometimes for hours. Things go even further sideways when Crestwood, a professional chef, begins to abuse crystal methamphetamine. For several years, up until his death in 2017, Crestwood would have a mental breakdown every January and even once tied a rope around his waist, much in the same manner as Pat's body was bound. Further, Crestwood's boat had red designs painted on it, and when Pat's boat was found, there was some transfer that appeared to be red paint evident on the vessel. This is really troubling because we know when um, law enforcement asks for tips from the public, one thing that they'll frequently put out there is, do you see anyone that's acting different, like mm -hmm. right around this crime? And uh, here, yeah, we have it for a period of time after, but this guy picks up a drug addiction, apparently, and who knows, maybe this is an addiction that was going on kind of, you know, under below the line for a while. And maybe now it's just starting to poke through. But mm -hmm. him, you know, on the anniversary of this occurrence, acting in that way, staring at the river crying, like there's a lot to be really concerned about with this. And it does seem like um, at a minimum, this has affected him in, in a way where he's taking something on with this. Tying mm -hmm. himself up in the similar fashion, that is really bizarre to me. And that really has me wondering, like, did he witness this? Is Is this just where his mind is going in the throes of his addiction. I don't know, but that's very, very strange. Do we know, is is Crestwood investigated further? Unfortunately, Crestwood dies of an apparent methamphetamine overdose on April 5th, 2017, without ever revealing the extent of his involvement in Pat's death to authorities. <clears throat> I, you know, this is something I, I remember a class on, actually thinking about people who are, you know, the cognitive load of having been involved in, in something like this and it, it becomes unbearable and it just sort of starts to really eke out of you in different ways that you can pick up. And it wasn't just e eking out of this guy it was like pouring out yeah. like a river of, you know, the cognitive turmoil he was in or the situation. Mm -hmm. I think what strikes me most interesting in this is that Damon wasn't particularly close to Pat. So the behavior that he's exhibiting is something that maybe you would think Pat's brother would be exhibiting, not this other person who is removed. Yeah. And similar to what you were saying, Rachel, the thing that also sticks out to me is the idea that he's looking out on the river sobbing. And I think that that's, that's just such an indicator that what's going on in his mind is most likely about Pat. But how we get there is a huge question mark. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we've also got this problem in terms of the delay of this thing being discovered you know like we're we don't have someone that is calling in a tip saying oh by the way pat had a, a person with him on the boat that day like i i saw that this guy damon crestwood got on the boat with pat so we have this time gap of making this discovery because it's being based on hey this guy isn't acting right in the years following this so it's probably impeding the investigation a bit like the first thing i'd be thinking if he did come up as a person of interest at the time check his cell phone, you know, find out where he was right. that day. Uh, can we line up any GPS information to make it look like, oh yeah, he did meet up with Pat's boat somewhere out there. Um, or did he have a shotgun? 
does he have a shotgun exactly and then we've we've also got this paint mm -hmm. we've got red paint some type of transfer on the boat um there's just there's a lot to really kind of break down with this the paint analysis is interesting to me um and andrea actually brought up before we started recording today that there are some databases uh, that are used for paint analysis. There's one in Canada in particular called PDQ, and it's maintained by BRCMP. And it contains chemical compositions of paint for most domestic and foreign car manufacturers and the majority of vehicles marketed in North America since 1973. Um, so for vehicle, for cars in particular, that would be a really strong resource. Uh, interestingly, we do have kind of a US version it's called the National Automotive Paint File, and it's maintained by the FBI. But both of these are very focused just on car paint jobs. Uh, we don't really see anything as in terms of a database for um, just manufactured paint jobs in general, which, you know, the boats maybe, uh, because of the different layers that have to be put on in terms of the paint application, maybe they could at least determine what model, what year that boat mm -hmm. is from. Um, but... We do have kind of a person in interest. Yes, it's in hindsight. They clearly at least identified that Damon did have a boat of some t some type that matches the color. Could they track that down? Could they test that paint against the paint that was found on Pat's boat? Well, we saw the family out here that just doesn't have answers, you know. So right. I'm just I'm wondering right. if there's some. Yeah, we're we're down we're down a ways from this occurrence now. We're some years away from it. But the pieces might still be out there, at least on that paint analysis front, to kind of weave it together. And even if it's not a solid answer, even if it's just we did the analysis and, yes, it matches the type of boat that he had. Maybe that's all that the family yeah. would need in terms of their understanding of, of what likely happened out there, even if you can't draw it to a full on, you know, get a, get a trial going and a search. You're, you're never going to have justice if Crestwood is the guy because... Right. He's not here anymore, but. Mm -hmm. But I think um, answers, obviously, are, are good. And there's so much stigma um, around people, tragically. There shouldn't be, but there's so much stigma around someone who would end their own life, too, mm -hmm. that it's often a hard thing for the family to bear as well. So, you know, if that wasn't the case, I'd. I don't know if it would make it any better that he was murdered, but mm -hmm. I think knowing or not knowing would be, you know, helpful to them at the very least. Yeah. 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 This case just, there are so many challenges with this case. It's unbelievable. Well, we'll add one more. Um, Daryl Davis, who was the lead detective on the case and who happened to be a former student of, his, of Patrick's wife, Jill Mullins, he was inexperienced and he was leading this death investigation and he had never conducted one before this. Oh, so wow. that may explain some of the concerns that we're having about the observations that were made in this case. Yeah, absolutely. There was also some contention between family and law enforcement over how authorities obtained some video footage under a CSX railway bridge. Jill felt police were treating her in a condescending manner, and they seemed put out by her demands for answers to her questions. Yeah, and that bridge, honestly, might have had some pieces of the puzzle. Like, it's got a good view of the river, and it might have just been something as simple as seeing that Pat wasn't out there alone, that there was someone mm -hmm. else on the boat. Like, that, especially now that we've talked about Crestwood a, lot, a little bit, it's just got my mind wrapped around, did he go to load his boat? Well, actually, if I remember right, they live on the water. Yes. So he's leaving pretty much from his backyard. So maybe there's yeah. not a lot of potential for someone that, you know, would basically come along for the ride. Oh, you're going to go test the, the engine out. Let me come along with you. Um, but that that railway bridge might have had some piece of the answer. And basically, Jill's knows, trying. Yeah. To, yeah. Jill's trying to get them to look at it. And it takes them so long that by the time they get to it, there's some question of if it's been recorded over and they're actually looking at the wrong date in terms of the footage. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that whole thing about families trying to get investigative steps to happen in a timely manner is just something that I hear about far too often with a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Um, the widow was outspoken in her criticism of the sheriff's office hesitation 
in investigating the death of her husband. And she really didn't make any secret of the fact that she did not think they were utilizing adequate resources in the case. Um, in October 2013, she felt patronized and she didn't feel like she was being taken seriously. So she hired an attorney to challenge the findings of the medical examiner and the authorities. The Mullins family established a memorial Facebook site and scheduled several fundraisers, ultimately raising $10,000 in reward money, hoping it would prompt someone to come forward with more information. And the sheriff's office acted in response to the publicity, announcing their own $10,000 reward, along with $10,000 raised in September by the Mullins family at a fundraiser and $1,000 from Crime Stoppers. It brings the total reward offered to $21,000. Well, I'm glad they're at least recognizing that there's some potential here that something else is going on. And, you mm -hmm. know, the sheriff is, is stepping up and adding to the reward fund like that. So where does the case stand today? Jill hasn't given up hope um, that what she believes um, is Pat's murder will one day be solved. In 2017, she put her house up for sale, though she planned on remaining in the area. She became engaged to a retired gentleman named Mike, who she had met in 2015. And she would only consider a relationship with him after she told him all about Pat's death and to her relief, he was really supportive of her efforts to uncover the truth about Pat's death. As recently as 2020, Jill was still posting signs and posters on the fairgrounds at the annual Manatee County Fair in the hopes that someone would come forward with new information about her husband's death. Also in 2020, Jill and her attorney finally succeeded in getting the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to classify the case as a homicide after being labeled as undetermined for years. However, that really appears to be the last activity on the case. Tips have dried up and forward motion seems to have stalled out. There was a new push for answers on this case though. Uh, Netflix, Unsolved Mysteries, has recently released an episode about Patrick's death called Body in the Bag. And we're hoping to also rally more people around this family to help move things forward for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I just want to say I think it's really special that Jill was so honest with her fiance about what was going on. And for him to support her in that way is is amazing. Um, I mm -hmm. know that there could be tough feelings when it comes to something like that. And sure. Uh, to, to really stand behind her is, is really amazing. And honestly, that's what we're looking for here. We're looking for more people to stand behind this family, keep asking these questions, keep the conversations going. And hopefully, I mean, even if it is a situation where the suspect is no longer alive, someone might have heard a conversation, had a conversation with this person. And we have a big question in terms of like, if it was Crestwood, what would the motive be? Like there's mm -hmm. there's all these unknown things and any one piece of that puzzle could be so helpful to the understanding for not just the investigators, but the family and obviously being part of a caring community like so many of you viewers out there are is such a big, it's such a big thing just, just mm -hmm. to be a part of that. And thank you guys so much for, for listening to these stories and caring about these cases. Of course, we want it solved but sometimes it's also just about showing support and compassion for the families that are in these troubling situations. Absolutely. And speaking of caring communities, if you're looking for a space to meet like-minded true crime enthusiasts and advocates who are also engaging in case discussions, look no further than the Uncovered community. Also in our community, you can attend live webinars presented by experts. We try to have um, you know, several a month, three or four a month. We even have a space in the community completely dedicated to this series with John Lorden, where we discuss all the cases we've covered in each episode. Regardless of whether you join our community or not, you still have access to the Uncovered database where you can see all of our sources and a full timeline about Patrick's case. This year, Patrick would have been only 62 years old. He was ready to live out an early retirement with fun hobbies, a new business idea, and plenty of time with family, but all of that was cut short in an instant. Someone out there may have information that can bring the truth to his family. 
If you're that person, if you have any information on this case, please contact the Manatee County Sheriff's Office at 941-747-3011. It's the number that's been on the screen this whole time. If you need to remain anonymous for any reason at all, you can also contact the Manatee County Crime Stoppers at 866-634-8477 or visit manateecrimestoppers.com. We'll have links in the description box down below. Uh, you can also reach out to the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Pat Mullins Memorial Fund, or you can email Pat Mullins Memorial Fund at gmail.com. That's kind of become the new home for uh, information that's going to go directly to the family. So you can use either of those resources. Also, if someone that you know or yourself is at risk of self-harm, please know there is help out there. You can read, reach out to the NSPH at 1-800-273-8255 for free confidential support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I know this time of year is tough for a lot of people out there. So please know that they're there to help. Thank you, Bradenton Herald, Sarasota Herald Tribune, ABC News, The Islander, Your Observer, Patch.com, Cinemaholic, Hollywood Outbreak, The Filmy Toast Blog, Legacy.com, Reddit, Web Sleuths, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's case. Also, a very big thank you to my friends and co-hosts from Uncovered.com, Rachel Roslett and Andrea Cipriano. Please join us again in two weeks as we look into yet another mystery that deserves to be uncovered.